That was me smashing a stack of scales with friends, and I recommend everyone do it. And while you're at it, break up with all the other scales and judgments that are holding you back and creating a happier and healthier life by building self-compassion in place of shame. I'm Rebecca Scritchfield, creator of the Body Kindness Philosophy and the book, which offers dozens of reflective prompts, infographics, and spiral up activities to get your brain focused on what really matters to you, not a diet plan or set of elusive rules that you're used to getting every time the conversation of weight comes up in your life. My goal with this podcast is to have interesting and important conversations about why body kindness can feel so hard and why we need a new inclusive definition for health so that everyone can heal and we stop judging ourselves and other people as not good enough and hopefully be the kind of compassionate and inclusive people the next generation needs us to be. You are not a project to complete. And your better life doesn't start after you've achieved some list of expectations. It starts by being good to yourself right now. Hey, helping pros. I am so excited to share that for the third year in a row, I am opening up my virtual mentor program called Learn and Grow. So you can check it out at bodykindnessbook.com slash learn and grow. That's bodykindnessbook.com slash learn and grow. So who is this for? This is for any helping professional at any stage of your career. If you work with people on helping them create a better life, you could be a dietitian, therapist, a health coach, a trainer, yoga teacher, Teacher, a life coach. So we've had all those folks in previous years. As long as you feel committed to helping people practice from a weight inclusive space, along with the philosophies and ideas in body kindness, I think that you're going to find this to be a great fit for you. I am really excited about ways where I can help you grow in your business. The way that we do that is you get monthly private chats with me and you can literally ask me anything. If you have big dreams about speaking, writing, putting your own work out into the world, being on interviews, podcasting, you can ask me anything, pick my brain. I would love to help you achieve your business goals. Yeah, I taught comedy. I taught at the Second City in Chicago. I taught comedy writing and satire. So like critically, I can't evaluate it as such. It wasn't. It was just kind of like making fun of fat people. And it was an attempt at making fun of the people who are permitting people to be overweight. And that doesn't even make sense. It was a weak joke and he loves to be provocative. So it was very on brand for him. You know, James Corden took an interesting approach back for it. I would love if a non higher weight person responded. Yeah, I would love it if Jimmy Fallon said, that's bullshit. Don't do that. That was Lisa Linky, a native of Champaign, Illinois. Lisa Linky is a multi-talented actress, writer, improviser, and podcast host. She has numerous TV credits under her belt, including a recurring role on TV Land's Teachers and guest roles on Shameless, Blackish, Grey's Anatomy, This Is Us, and Modern Family, to name just a few. She can be seen in a recurring role in ABC's Bless This Mess and a guest role on Netflix's AJ and the Queen. She wrote, produced, and starred in Dog Moms, a parody web series based on Dance Moms. Linky also hosts the Hashtag Suggestion Sunday show every Sunday at 12.30 p.m. Pacific. This is an Instagram live show where she improvs with guests based on viewer suggestions. Linky also co-created and hosts the Go Help Yourself podcast, which reviews self-help books with a comedic twist. She resides in Los Angeles with her dogs, Zoe and Wrigley. I was so honored to sit down and talk with Lisa about all things in our culture, especially recently what has been going on in the entertainment industry when Bill Maher made those horrific comments about why we need weight stigma and also James Corden's responses. And Lisa shares what she would have liked to seen also occur, which I found to be very interesting and insightful. Lisa also shares about her own body positivity journey and how social media has helped her in particular. I found that to be really helpful and educational and for all the other content 
content creators out there and you know you're putting stuff out there, always counting likes and comments, turns out that you are influencing and helping people even when you don't necessarily get that feedback of the reach and the impact and the stats and the analytics and all those things. So let's keep sharing and inspiring each other. That's the message that I got from her there. Uh, You really do want to check out Lisa's podcast. It is really good. I added it to my can't miss list. There are some really insightful perspectives that they share, and they really do a great job thoroughly going through self-help, the pros and cons, things that they found helpful. And it's opinion-based. It's easy to listen to. And I have just really enjoyed becoming a listener to her show. And so please go check that out. Check out all her great stuff. And again, if you have any questions or comments about this or any other show, you can email me. It's Rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com. If you have a question that you would like to have answered on the show, that's bodykindnessbook.com slash question. And if you would like to get started with Body Kindness, the book is available wherever books are sold. Also on audiobook if you prefer to listen, which I don't blame you. That's what I like to do. If you would like some additional help, there's a free get started guide at bodykindnessbook.com slash start. You'll get a video, a self-reflection guide. I'll check in with you on how um, you could practice body kindness in ways big and small. And you get a little bit more of the backstory about how I came to write the book and how readers are implementing it. And so if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, again, that's bodykindnessbook.com slash start. Hey, Lisa, welcome to Body Kindness. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to have you and chat with you. This is awesome. But I wanted to start out first is just finding out all the good stuff. I want to know what you're working on and what's really exciting you. Yeah. So right now I'm we're filming season two of Bless This Mess. Yay! Yes. It premieres actually <laughs> tomorrow night. I don't know when this is going to air, but it premieres in September, okay. uh, September 24th. Yeah. Okay. And I'm so excited. This season is so much fun. I'm having the best time. And everybody there, it's just, I mean, it's just a dream to work with everybody. So that's that's a delight. Every episode I'm on, I'm just thrilled. And then I'm also shooting um, an indie film right now that is also really amazing and super fun. And I can't talk a whole lot about it because they're not really <laughs> talking about it. But yeah, I mean, getting to, I've been, lately I've been getting to like meet and work with people that I've either admired or just fan girled about my whole life. So that's been really, really thrilling. Oh, that's so awesome. I'm so happy for you. Yes. I, I love Bless This Mess. I'm from Northeast Ohio, and I always identify that as the Midwest. But, yes. you know, I don't yes. know technically, but it's just there. I could just relate on so many levels. My husband grew up on a farm in West Virginia, and it's just great comedy, and you've got a great cast there. And yeah, it just must be so thrilling. I mean, I can't believe you have the job you have. It's so exciting. I mean, I can't either. I can and I can't. Like, yeah. you know, I've been working so hard at it, but also, yeah, it, yeah I do get to pinch myself a lot. Yeah. It is, it's so great. And I, the show is so fun. And this season is hilarious. So you're going to be really, really yeah. happy. Yeah. I, you know, I'd love to, I mean, you obviously do work really hard in a really long time. And, and I definitely want to talk about that. And I would love to know more about like your experience being in entertainment, not just being a woman, but being a higher weight woman. And like, I mean, what is that? Is it as bad as I'm imagining worse? You know, it can be uh, because, you know, you just have for anybody, Mm -hmm. any actor, you don't have a lot of control, right? Mm -hmm. You have about 2% of control about what happens, (laughs) Wow. you know? And so, yeah. So I think what I've really focused on is just my craft and being as good as I can so that that doesn't become a factor that's a barrier for my career. Mm -hmm. Right. Like obviously there are roles that I'm not right for, but that, that happens for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I do think right now it's been a really nice time where people are craving, we've always been craving more, diversity on screen and representation Mm -hmm. on screen Mm -hmm. in all areas, differently abled bodies, different shapes, different sizes, different races, different sexual orientations, you know, different abilities, everything. So I think now what's nice is that I'm not sure what it's, what it, I think it's a, a mixture of everything, but I think people in charge are recognizing that that also equals value, that there's value in that. And it isn't kind of a fringe 
opportunity that it, there's real money in that. Yes. And also that there are more people in those marginalized groups behind the camera and in production. So I think it's just kind of a combination of a lot of those things. And hopefully we're just kind of evolving as a culture. <laughs> oh gosh, I hope, you know, I just, as a mom of two girls, I'm like, what well, can right? we please make this world better? And, you know, and I don't know, like any, any time now, when I really think about the big issues of the day, I was like, you know, maybe it's not adults that are going to save the kids. The kids are going to save themselves, but it does, yeah. it does make me, I mean, right. With like climate change and every, you know, you just see yeah. you know, the young gun activists, you just see like, there are a lot of things that keep us up at night and just, you know, we want a better world. And it's like, I think the more we do to be inclusive and intersectional and empowering. And I, I think you hit on a great point. It's like, when we have more marginalized people in those decision-making roles, the opportunities just open up. And, you know, I, for one, as a viewer, I don't want to see the same people in the big roles. And I don't want to see kind of like, I don't know, you could tell me what the lingo is, but it's almost like a coded character. Like if we're going to have a fat woman, she better be funny and she have this particular problem or we're just not casting that. So is there like a word for yeah. that where they pigeonhole? Maybe that's the word. I don't know. Well, a lot of times people are called character actors, which okay. means that they're not quote unquote, like beautiful. Right. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think that actually holds true anymore. Cause I think that a lot of stories are being told about people that, and again, I'm not the expert on this. I just mm -hmm. also like you, I'm a consumer, right. right? I'm also <laughs> a writer. So I, I do know a little bit and I come from comedy. So I know a lot and I taught, comedy writing. So I know all more, but <laughs> I think there's this perception that representation on screen is just kind of like a box that you can check. Right. And it makes sense. You know, does art mirror life or does life mirror art? Who knows? But I think that when we think about marginalized groups in a small, limited way, without giving those individuals the full breadth of a human experience, mm -hmm. How could we expect writers who are traditionally white, male, Ivy League educated, especially comedy writers, mm -hmm. to represent marginalized people in any other way other than kind of the small, limited version? Yeah, Does exactly. That make sense? Oh, a hundred percent. It's like they're, they're using their frame of the context of their privileged lived experience. So how are they even going to yes. think about the wants and needs of like it would be great, you know, to be become a more privileged woke person of power. But what that also means is being willing to share that power and lift yeah. others up. And, and I don't necessarily blame them because mm -hmm. they're also existing in the same culture that oppresses people systemically right. to exist in those small squares, right? right? So people of size are expected to behave or live this kind of life. Mm -hmm. And there isn't representation on screen, in media. I mean, I remember Ashley Nicole Black and the other um, wonderful reporter or writer on Full Frontal with Sam B. Mm -hmm. They talked about how there is no like humanizing B roll of people of size. Mm -hmm. So whenever news news runs uh, any article about weight related or obesity or whatever new study, mm -hmm. it's this headless unflattering of people doing of people doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And so they created free B roll of like people living their lives. And there's that whole like stock photo of just, we, we put people in a box, I guess, yeah. I guess I'm, what I'm saying. So I think with more opportunity and more diversity behind the camera in production, I think we'll start to see more realistic of how people are because not everybody is a size zero. We know the average American size is what, a 14, a 16 for a woman mm -hmm. and size American sizing and women's clothes sizing is crazy to begin with anyway. Like <laughs> it's not a standard. So I think that when you see yourself represented, you can actually identify with the story more and get more invested. Yeah. Yeah. In, in your personal life, how did you become body positive? Were you like born that way, raised that way, or was it a journey in and to and of itself? It. I am also from the Midwest. So oh, okay. I'm from the Midwest, raised on shame, so I'm very familiar. <laughs> so I think for me, I just finally, you know, I really resisted moving out to LA for a very long time because I thought there's no work for me and I'll just, body issues would, would become like my, my only thing. Mm -hmm. And my great friend Allison said, there's work for everybody out here. I'm so grateful for her for sharing that with me. You know, and when I came out here, I did kind of have to find my niche and I had to find it like 
not being the quote fat girl. Do you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. just kind of embracing it and working with my therapist who I really adored, but he was not steeped in body positivity. So when I found myself kind of explaining to him Mm -hmm. that I am not my body, Mm -hmm. I was kind of like, okay, I have to do this work on my own, Mm -hmm. you know? And so like four years ago, I started trying to just read a body positivity book, you know, Mm -hmm. and introduce myself to that. And Instagram really helped me in that regard. That's awesome. It's very informative when you follow body positive accounts. Mm -hmm. People challenge my thinking still. And sometimes I I recognize, oh, I'm not comfortable with this. You know, Mm -hmm. and I catch myself in my thinking, oh, I still think that I need to look a certain way before my life begins, that kind of shit. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I don't know if you cuss. Like oh no, every episode's exquisite just for that reason. <laughs> Thank you. I cuss in my everyday <laughs> life all the time. So, yeah. So I feel like that's been really helpful, and to start to recognize fat phobia and fat bias as an actual thing, yeah, really also liberated me. And I'm, I'm very privileged in that I can buy clothes in some stores and online. Like I have some privilege that a lot of people who are people of size don't. So mm-hmm. I just. I've really kind of evolved and I'm still evolving, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's so interesting when you steep yourself in that and then you hear, I just am now way more aware of how much time and energy people spend talking about their body and their diet. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to not do that. (laughs) It feel, it does feel freeing just to say, just to kind of take some of that power back and to let, definitely let it be something that you're always learning because we're always in relationship with ourselves. And yeah. and even this idea of like when we think about like health or pursuing health, right? If we start from the broken definition that it is size and weight dependent, right? That keeps all the power in diet culture is like, I'm the problem, I'm the problem, I'm the problem. But even if you say, you know what, I don't have to trade off values for wanting to care for my body, but how do I care for my body right now without trying to control it or without saying, oh, you know, the only reason why I'm going to eat this salad today is because I know it's going to result in weight loss and I know that's going to make life better. Like we, we do need to do better at knowing the two factors at play. Like we're all in a diet culture and that it is systemic in saying, you know, the reason you eat that salad is so you will lose weight. And so even it's when we so hear that, right? It's hard to untangle that. Isn't it? Like it's really hard. And I think more men are experiencing this, but I think traditionally women, especially mm-hmm. North American culture, experience this on the regular that like everything is tied into that. The choice of clothes that I wear. And I also think that for higher weight women or women of size, this idea that they have to be ultra feminine in order to walk around the world Mm -hmm. and take up space. Mm -hmm. You can't be very fat and also not be very made up. Mm -hmm. You know, like those are mutually exclusive somehow in our society, right? Like being super hyper feminine with a lot of makeup allows your fatness. It's so strange to me, but it's, Mm -hmm. it's true. It's present. So like all of these things, what makeup I put on, what clothes I wear, if I work out, how I work out, what I say about food, if I eat in front of other people, I just think that part of me once some days is like, God, I would just like the privilege of walking around in a thin body. But I also know that's a trap because Mm -hmm. they're not free of it. They're not totally free, but Is it bad to want that when really what you're seeking is freedom from the oppression, right? That's really what I want. What I want is for everybody to feel freedom to walk around as they are, not having to justify their existence by how much they work out or what they eat or what they wear or how they look. Mm -hmm. That's what I really want. Mm -hmm. And I've been so conditioned to want the ideal that I've lost sight of the fact that that's all an illusion, you know, like. We already are who we are, and I am not my body. My spirit is not my body. You Mm -hmm. know, if I got hit by a bus tomorrow and lost the use of all my extremities, am I no longer myself? Do you know what I mean? Like there are parts of me that I would grieve, but I am still me. And Mm -hmm. so the physical form is just this thing that we're in some ways in our culture just really revering when it's, you know, and then it gets into youth and age and, oh, my God, it's just so encompassing. And I feel like we're so twisted about it. So yeah, you're right. What I've been conditioned to think, I want this ideal. Mm-hmm. When what I really want is everyone to feel 
acceptance and the ability to be at home in their own body. Right. Yeah. And and I do think it can get can get scary and overwhelming really quickly, actually, because it's like, I mean, I'll have clients that struggle with going on a walk in the woods to be out in nature and clear their mind because it's like, oh, well, this is exercise. Am I conforming to diet culture? Right? Almost like it's a new set of roles and a new pass fail. It's like, yes. we are in diet culture. It's been decided. Yes. And and there's still going to be, I hate to say it, but there's still going to be weight stigma even when we're gone. You know? Yeah. And so that doesn't mean be apathetic and don't even try. It means we try. We try really hard. But we also have to have a good day today and a good moment. And so that fact of what is our autonomy, right? I have the privilege to have free time to be able to move and I have safe spaces to move. I decide what I want to do, why I want to do it, and if I want to do it at all. And so, and, yeah. you know, let, letting that be enough. And when you hear that, oh, you're conforming, it's like, well, thank you, mind, for keeping me alert to the fact that I don't want to conform to diet culture. But I'm also enjoying movement as a way to help myself sleep, manage my emotions, give myself some thinking time. So this matters to me then so much more than what society wants to say. And that could be true whether you're yes. on that walk of the woods or you're in a soul cycle class and the girl next to you is like, oh, finally I can eat lunch. You know, it's like we can't control everybody. And so no, if we're expecting no. everyone to do what we do, we're going to be miserable. I do also want to say that like it's such an interesting point, this freedom, you know, like I want to be able to move how I want to move. And I personally, on my journey of becoming more aware and being more open and you know, I hate being like, I'm trying to be more woke, but I really am. You know, <laughs> you can't talk about ways, weight without intersecting with class and race, right? Totally. Like, and so the fact that I could go out for a walk in my neighborhood when I wanted to, isn't the same for other people. Do mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Totally. And it's just so fascinating to me. And I, I guess what frustrates me the most and I've learned this by, by doing my podcast, which I want to just talk about briefly. And I want you to come on and be a guest. Woohoo! Um, that's and, exciting. Uh, when people treat this, this compounded issue that's like a knot of yarn yeah. as an either or a binary thing, mm-hmm. I get so frustrated. Mm. And because it comes from their lens. Mm-hmm. Well, if you just drink warm water with lemon every morning, <laughs> you'll be fine. If you just do this... When people prescribe what worked for them to everyone in the whole world, I get so mad and it has helped me from reading these self-help books for my podcast, Go Help Yourself, which I I hate self-help inherently and my co-host loves it. I've learned that because it's an intersectional, that enrages me in such a way. Yeah. It's just not. It's not fair, and that really, I have like such an innate sense of justice. Like that's not fair. Yeah, that's not nice. That's not fair, and I get mad. Oh, I mean, you could even look at well, who? I mean, it's hard to get published, but who gets to get published? Oh, right. It's you know, insane. You know, it's insane. Yeah, and and it's. I mean, I being a published author. Yes. I didn't see it at the time, but now I definitely see it. You know, and then even then, okay, I have this book opportunity, but I still answer to an editor who did have specific thoughts about where I was going with things. And so, and it's like Maya Angelou, right? You do the best you can. And when you know better, you do better. I think we all need some element of continued self-compassion as a human. We are mistake prone and we're going to keep making mistakes, but we got to have a gut that we trust that says, I think this is the next right step. I think this is the next right direction. And I think so many, you know, we just want things to be easier, faster, and it makes sense that we do. But when it's not easy and fast, that frustration and that rage, it's just like, I'm going to go off again. (laughs) I also think that's a very North American mindset, right? Like somebody's right, somebody's wrong. Yep. There's one solution that'll fix all of this. Mm-hmm. And it's typically my idea, right? Yep. Like, yep. You know, I, it's my idea that will fix all of this. Totally. That's yeah. And I need to be prescriptive. Yeah. But actually, you brought up your podcast. And I, yes, I will definitely be a guest. It was, thank I, you. I, when I was listening, I was like, oh my gosh, they hate self help. What will they say about body kinds? I was like, but yet well, I want to talk listen. about it. So your shows are awesome. Very helpful. Oh, thank you. Yours is, <laughs> we're having a mutual admiration society right <laughs> okay. here. That's one of my favorite onion headlines along time ago, it was like a group of women spend a whole night at the bar validating the shit out of each other. <laughs> <laughs> that's, 
that's a perfect onion headline. <laughs> but no, Missy is really great. She loves it, and she loves finding something useful, right? Uh-huh. She's really good at that. She's mm-hmm. like a sharpshooter. Mm-hmm. I, being from the Midwest, hate anybody telling me what to do. <laughs> so I immediately hate the whole concept of self-help. Uh-huh. And we've kind of gotten in some cool, larger discussions, like some kind of meta-level discussions about, like, the whole concept of self-help. Is yeah. that fair? Yeah. Why is it upon self, an individual to address problems mm-hmm. that may be more systemic or societal. A hundred percent. It's it's faux concept. powerment, right? So Jacqueline Friedman, who wrote Unscrewed, she talks about faux powerment. And, and she talks about in terms of sexual empowerment is like, you know, it's faux powerment when you talk about all these things that women can do for their sexual empowerment without directly addressing the systems and structures that actually help empower women's sexual wellness. So, yeah, Isn't it? it is insane. It's crazy. Yeah. I don't know why, but this thing that I'm sure you've seen it, but it's, it really, and I'm going to bring this back to more body positivity stuff. Sure. Sometimes I think I see things on Instagram and it just unlocks for me, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like you can read stuff in a book and it can challenge you, but it's something about just the short nature of the, you know, caption on Instagram and the photo with it mm-hmm. is very powerful. Mm. And I've always hated BMI. I have read health at every size. So I understand like why that's a flawed, but somebody just wrote like, if you believe and you follow the BMI, then the rock is obese. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, he's six, four. And he's like two something, you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. whenever you put it in, you're like, oh yeah. When, when that, I just was like, that one unlocked it for me. And I was like, yeah, that's no longer a useful when people say the word obese, it doesn't work for me anymore because right. that's based on BMI. BMI is a flawed indicator. And the people who created it didn't even want it to be used the way it's being used. You know, like right. I just love getting into the history. That kind of stuff makes me crazy. Oh, and also, do you know where the 10,000 steps a day came from? Yeah, I recently heard that that was made up to sell pedometers. <laughs> yes. It was by a Japanese company that had pedometers and the yeah. kanji or the character yeah. for 10,000 looked like a person walking. Oh my gosh. I know. So it's like that couldn't, for me, epitomize our relationship with capitalism and consumerism yeah. any better than like they said this was the thing and I bought it and now I just measure myself up to this thing every day that nobody really does. Mm-hmm. I mean, have you heard about the history of the bathroom scale? No. Okay. So there was a thing called the penny scale. And it was like an entertainment thing, like a joke, like outside of the picture movie or whatever. You put a penny in, you step on it, you see a number. I was like, oh, it was like total novelty. It was a game. But they made like for the time, it was the late 1800s, they made a lot of money, like $11,000. And they're like, wow, people are really obsessed with this thing. It was the technology was advanced to the point in in one of the first U.S. scales is actually the it's still in business today. They basically got the device to be small enough and they basically invented it like total madman era, as you would expect, right? Like we need to invent a use like they put in the bathroom. They invented a use one of their first ads. It says like for daily health, happiness and well-being and something, something, you know, they had to blur, you know, like weigh yourself daily. Like they had to pick out, well, we want women, a woman in her house coat with her rollers. They have an ad where the daughter is glaring up at the mother, like with these gazy eyes, like, oh, mommy, I trust you. I mean, it is so bad. And this was the early 1900s. So and it's, that's it, right? Okay. So for your <laughs> listeners who can't see me, yeah. I am like, I keep slapping my forehead <laughs> because of course it just dawned on me that there was a time before bathroom scale <laughs> and people didn't need to know what they weighed every day. No, nope. but I'm so blown away by that concept <laughs> that people just moved about their life, not knowing or caring what they weighed and they were fine. We are all being gaslit. And you know, the thing that I can't get over is, and I forget, I want it. Who, what, who was my guest who told me, Oh, Emily Nagoski, when we were talking about come as you are, which that book was very helpful to me in many ways. Uh, <laughs> she said, you know, Rebecca, women couldn't get their own credit cards till like 1975. And I yes. was like, what? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which, uh, whenever women are like, we don't need feminism, I'm like, you're under the age of like 30. Yeah. So it has no concept to you that add 15 years to your age and you would not have been able to buy a car. Yeah. Yeah. It's really fascinating to me. I think if you can open yourself up to the concept that 
oppression exists. Mm -hmm. Systemic oppression exists, whether it's racist, classist, Mm -hmm. sizist, ableist, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Then when you acknowledge that and grieve that for however long it takes you to grieve it, because it (laughs) sucks. Then I think you can start to free yourself from this idea of having to conform Mm -hmm. because you realize, oh, it's all, it's all a sham. Yeah. And a good, you know, um, well-placed anger and rage is probably pretty appropriate and, and complete that stress cycle. And where I would say where, where body kindness comes in is it's like, I want you to feel all your emotions and I want you to understand that. Yes, it is enraging to to realize how much time you've lost about blaming yourself and telling you yourself that you're the problem. You're still going to hear that voice just because you picked up the book doesn't mean that right. all, all of a sudden that voice goes away. But it's right. more about noticing these thoughts and being able to place them like, okay, so this is a voice in my mind, but it's really not in line with the kind of person I want to be. I've learned more about right. systems and structure. So let me just let this thought sit there. It's not problematic in and of itself. It's problematic when I want to ignore it, numb it, or chase it away. Just here you are. I acknowledge you. Now this is my values, self-care choice. This is the body kindness thing I can do right now. And that's, I think. I think that's hard. That's the hard work, right? Like (laughs) for me, getting angry is easy. For other people, getting angry is hard. Like my mother hates getting angry. Uh Can't we all be nice to each other all the time? Please. Yes, exactly. (laughs) That's the Midwest. But For me, yeah, it's figuring out in that moment what that is and then not judging that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The remnants of living in this oppression, living in this, the remnants of that, of me judging like, well, actually what really feels good right now is to sit on the couch Mm -hmm. and watch TV and fighting that voice of, is that numbing out? Are you, should you be, you know what I mean? It's like, no, I'm. I'm actually exhausted and I'm tired and I don't, I don't want to think anymore. And so what I can do for myself right now is just sit and knit and watch TV. And you know what? That's okay. I don't Mm -hmm. have to be perfect. I don't have to be my ideal self. Letting go of my ideal self was, and I still struggle with it, you know, Mm -hmm. but it's so not fun living, like having these two lives living parallel and me never living up to this other one that isn't real. It's not real. It's fabricated. Yeah. Yeah. And that when nothing is ever good enough, I mean, that's, that's perfectionism and no, no human being can live up to a standard of perfectionism. And so it's about noticing these thoughts like, wow, I'm really feeling guilty about taking some downtime. Well, sometimes I'll go like, what would I say to like, if I'm I'm on the stage and it's a thousand 12 year olds, would I tell them, how dare you knit and sit on the couch? (laughs) You know, it'll really kind of check my mind real quick. My friend Deanna, who is a life coach, and she's a good friend of mine, yeah. and we've been friends before she went on this uh, journey to become a life coach. I remember one day I called her, and I didn't, I didn't want to go to my acting class because I just was so tired, and I just didn't, I couldn't have it. But I was breaking myself over the coals, right? Mm-hmm. And she said, "We're on the phone," and she said, "Lisa, what would you say to me if I called you and told you how tired I was?" I would say, you don't have to go to that class. You just, you get to choose. And she pulled this fucking Jedi mind trick on me. It made me so mad. She said, okay, now I want you to use your name and tell yourself that. And I immediately went, "Ah!" I started crying so hard. (laughs) The idea of giving myself permission to not be perfect was so upsetting. And I do feel like I've gotten past that because... Mm -hmm. And I think part of that is age. Like my mom always used to say that to me. She's like, you get really upset about things. And as you get older, you just don't have the energy for it. And she's like, I like that. I was like, okay. I, I, at the time I was like, that's crazy. But now I do think it's like, you know, I don't have the energy to debate now, especially also having seen the other side of it, Mm -hmm. that I could rake myself over the coals for 40 minutes and then make a choice, or I could just make a choice and then be done with it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and the more we practice that permission and then we see the benefits, it actually was really beneficial that I took that, that downtime or that meantime. Like we get in, especially American culture, busyness is a bragging, right? I'm so busy. How many people start their email? So sorry for the delay. And I'm like, it's been 30 minutes. <laughs> That's not a delay. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's cultural. Uh, I do that when it's been a month since I've emailed. <laughs> 
And that's a legit apology. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Okay. I could see a sorry for the delay if someone's waiting a month. Sure, sure, sure. But yeah. 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 You know, I think with practice, we, we start to see more of the benefits. And when we feel better emotionally and, you know, life does feel more meaningful. And again, we could still be angry that the world isn't moving faster, that it, that there are still work to do. And at the same time, part of what's going to keep us in this game of anti-oppression work is also not neglecting our own well-being and our own self-care. Yes, that's our a piece I humanity. could definitely work on. There you I go. I will say I have, I have many years of therapy, individual and group mm-hmm. combined over 20 years. And for me, group therapy was the best thing for helping me learn compassion, Mm. really practicing my compassion for others and seeing them give compassion to me, gave me the ability to give compassion to myself. Yeah. Right. So forming those intimacy connections of intimacy with people who I only knew inside this therapeutic group Mm -hmm. to see them give me compassion and knowing them and trusting them really gave me the capabilities of being compassionate with myself. Yeah. So it's, you know, and that was over, that was, gosh, coming up on like 15 years ago. So it has been a long journey and I'm not anywhere near it. You know, Mm -hmm. I still get mad. I still have clothes in my closet that I will never wear again, but I'm holding on to them. And it's like, let it go. (laughs) All right. You're going to, you're that, that is going to be a goal, right? Find a meaningful place. And take that action. That is something that I bet you you'll feel so much better after and also feeling good knowing that people who can really use them and need them will be getting them. And so so I'm going to hold you to that. (laughs) Thank you. You know, I think it's – I do purge kind of frequently. I think there's something – I think it's holding back to that – that's that diet culture, right? Like I can be this shape that I was before, mm-hmm. which is so stupid. It's mm-hmm. just stupid. It, it is stupid. And also I want to say it's not stupid because mm-hmm. that's the culture that I've been steeped in mm-hmm. for decades. Mm-hmm. So for me to just say it's stupid isn't fair to myself. Mm-hmm. It carries a lot of weight. Right. It carries a lot of mental weight, you know? Mm-hmm. So I I have to have compassion with myself for that, and then I'll be able to let it go. Yeah, and like we were saying earlier, reframing it, you know, that it's it's not about that you were saying that you have a problem. Culture still has a problem with people of size. So when you're trying to get more social power and relief from the oppression – who wouldn't want that? I mean, I still, any client who comes in, comes in the door and sits down and I market, you know, body kindness, weight inclusive, health at every size. Yay. And it still happens. Come sit down. Hey, here's sure. the bathroom. Would you like a drink? Sit down. How can I help you today? Well, I got to do something about this weight, you know, that comes out in some way. And so it's this really interesting thing that I don't think that we should expect that every single person can just let that go, right? It's more about changing our relationship to what it all means. It is. And I also just want to acknowledge it's asking a lot on the oppressed, Mm -hmm. you know, as we do across the board. Mm -hmm. You know, we're asking a lot of the oppressed to manage their life experience in this oppressed system versus Mm -hmm. everyone working to remove the oppression. Yeah. We're much more comfortable as a society to say, no, you're different, you're wrong, you fix it versus, oh my gosh, you're experiencing something different simply because of something physical or Mm -hmm. the way that you look or, and that's not right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's really really stuck in that. Yeah. Well, and then, I mean, we're seeing it play out today in the entertainment world. I, I haven't actually asked anybody about this, but it just popped in my mind. Did you happen to see like Bill Maher talk about we need weight stigma back. Yeah. And then yeah. J- James Corden kind of did a rebuttal. Like, did you catch that yeah. at all? Or what are your I thoughts did. on all that? Listen, Bill Maher gets paid to do what he does well, which is to just really be provocative. Yes. <laughs> I don't think he feels like he was and his writers were doing anything wrong because he still exists in diet culture Mm -hmm. where that's permitted. Mm -hmm. It's permitted and permissible to oppress people who don't conform to this quote unquote health myth. Right. Mm -hmm. And so on the one hand, do I think it was excellent comedy? No. Mm -hmm. If he were in my comedy class and he brought that in, I would say, 
this isn't satire. This isn't, this, this isn't funny. Mm -hmm. You're punching down. You've got to find a smarter way to do it. Like James Corden did Mm -hmm. either by punching up or making fun of himself in that sense. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I think we, it's also, it just is a great demonstration of how far we still have to go as a culture to view people, higher weight people, people of size, whatever your preference is of mm-hmm. saying it as a marginalized group. Mm-hmm. Because I think we still have this. And it's I, also, I don't blame them because we've been fed this myth that mm-hmm. it's entirely within our control and we just need to eat less and exercise more mm-hmm. and then it'll be fine. And that's you know, while we have known for decades that that is simply not the truth Mm -hmm. and that diets don't work and that people of different class and race and don't have access like other people do, we're not willing to put that together. I think it's a a very American notion, just like self-help, I am in control of it. And so it's all this individual, it's individual. And so to look at this, I, I don't know, I'm kind of talking around a lot of it. I think that what he said, a lot of people agree with, Mm-hmm. And it just disappointed me because it's it feels it felt like really cheap comedy. It offended me as a comedian because it wasn't particularly great comedy, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it offended me. <laughs> you as could a do better, Bill. <laughs> yeah, it offended me as a person because it took a marginalized group mm-hmm. and didn't get into any of the intricacies or details as to why people might be existing this way. I mean, I don't think he would have said that about people on welfare, but you know, there's a lot of reasons why people or homeless people. There's a lot of reasons why people end up homeless, but we don't just say to say to somebody who's homeless, get a job is not cool anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we understand more. So I just can't wait for the day when somebody says, just work out more. And somebody else says, that's not how it works. Do you know what I'm saying? Totally. That took me a long time. No, no, that was good. Um, there was, it was really good for me to listen. and, And I really value your perspective, especially being an entertainer. I just think you have a really valuable perspective to see things from a different place. Me not being a famous entertainer and actor, <laughs> you know, to really understand well, that there's an art being behind a famous entertainer and actor. Either. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I taught comedy. I taught at the second city in Chicago. I yeah. taught comedy writing and satire. So yeah. like critically, I can't evaluate it as such. It yeah. wasn't, it was just kind of like making fun of fat people. Yeah. And it was an attempt at making fun of the people who are permitting Mm -hmm. people to be overweight. And that doesn't even make sense. It was a weak joke Mm -hmm. and he loves to be provocative. So it was very on brand for him. Right. You know, James Corden took an interesting approach back for it. I would love if a non higher weight person responded. Really? Yeah. I would love it if Jimmy Fallon said, that's bullshit. Don't do that. I would love it. Ah, so uh, as an ally, Right, as a thin yeah. privilege ally to say, I'm really glad that James Corden came out and said this. And as a person with thin privilege, you know, yeah. this is ridiculous. Yeah. Okay, I could see that. It so was Sarah interesting because when you first said, said that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah Silverman has said that her least favorite kind of comedy is jokes that makes fun of how people look. She's like, that's, that's lame. Mm-hmm. You know, she's like, you know, fat jokes about women are, are really, it's lame. It's, mm-hmm. and, and on top of it, it's like decade, it's centuries old. Like there's nothing new about it. So like, if you're going to be cutting edge, find a way to be cutting edge. Right. That's comedy. But like, there's nothing funny about that. So when a straight sized person comes out as an ally, to me, that's much more powerful. Mm-hmm. James Corden, in some sense is defending himself mm-hmm. and that's great. And he has a platform, but man, I would have loved, and I'm sure Samantha B might've said something I didn't say, I didn't see, but like, mm-hmm. I would love for a white, straight-sized male to say, shut up. Mm -hmm. That's stupid. That's not – you're really oversimplifying something that is so intricate and involves class and race and gender and – disease and you know like just so just shut up really right and to your point about the samantha b skit thick not sick i mean i think they did a much better job because they also addressed the piece that james corden left out which i mostly loved and was like rah 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 but that's this gaping hole where there was some upholding of the assumption that higher weight people might be less healthy and you know that kind of a thing and again it was 
I'm not going to judge what he said because I think that he did make an impact to help people think differently. Maria Shriver shared James Corden's response and was like, this is much better. So it's like major impact. And I was in there tagging my Hayes uh, higher weight, you know, advocates to be like, hey, do you want to comment on this Maria Shriver? Like right on her post so they could chime in with what they liked about his response and what they didn't to just extend that education. But what I loved about the Thick Not Sick skit is how they really did happen to do a great job at challenging the systemic oppression and just say, you know, yes. you know, higher weight people aren't necessarily sick and we need to stop that right away. And that's yes. what I think all, all of everybody who exists needs to, we need to learn what weight stigma is and how it oppresses people. And we need to undo this harm as best we can. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's one of my favorite tweets too. This woman is like, for all of you people talking about overweight people's health, you've never commented on my health and I do heroin, eat nothing but Taco Bell and Cheetos. Mm -hmm. And I've never gotten a comment about somebody being worried about my health. So mm -hmm. this, this shit needs to stop. Oh. You know, and she was a quote unquote skinny, mm -hmm. right? Like a straight sized person. Mm -hmm. She's a, a small sized person and she was calling it out. And that's the kind of shit that we need, mm -hmm. right? We yeah. need just like people of color need white allies. People of size, I think, need straight sized allies. People with different abilities need able bodied allies. Like, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is. <laughs> this is nothing new in human nature, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's nothing new. I think I started my career as a helping professional in 2007 and very quickly realized that everything that I was still upholding in diet culture was messed up for me and my clients. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I had this benefit of like lurking and learning and listening. And it's, it's definitely I've never been more excited about this opportunity to say diets really aren't the way to create a better life. I just hope uh, the more mainstream it becomes that we don't lose focus of the most marginalized folks and we have to be intersectional about it. And yes, it's okay to work on yourself and at the same time recognize that there are ways in which there are some people who are on the edges who are going to get left out of those conversations if we're going to uphold this assumption that the only way you're going to improve your health is if you, like you talked about, just work harder and put all the resources you have into weight loss. That's just, that's a whole money-making scheme. And it's really unhelpful. It's such, it is. And it's such a privileged opportunity, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. If I'm working three jobs mm -hmm. and I'm food insecure, <laughs> I don't have an hour to work out. Uh, right. right. What's you know what I mean? Like, and probably the stress of my life it's, is what's contributing to how my body looks and feels. Oh, yeah. So maybe instead of telling me to work harder, mm -hmm. you fucking raise the minimum wage. Right, exactly. <laughs> that and just there have always been fat people on the planet and there will be yeah. fat people on the planet. And, and even if percentages are changing, there are lots of reasons why and very, very little have to do with individual choices. Yes. That doesn't mean we won't make choices that can help how our genes are expressed, right? But yes. it's like by shaming everyone and saying nothing you do is good enough, it's just we're creating much more harm. And I think there's a better, smarter way to help people. And, and really, honestly, like the field of medicine, and that includes, you know, helping professionals, you know, where I primarily work, it's we have got to not only acknowledge our own privilege, but understand that there are ways that you can help people with who might have weight concerns without upholding that idea of, yes, I need to weigh you before you come into this appointment. Yes, I'm going to give you a lecture about your weight and your BMI so insurance pays me. And yes, I'm going to center the idea that weight loss must be achieved. Like That is such a powerful system that I don't think medicine is doing enough work to self-examine oh. the harm that they're doing. No. <laughs> I went to an endocrinologist last year mm -hmm. to talk about something going on with my brain. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to talk. She talked to me for a full 15 minutes about exercise. Oh, God. And I am a person who is very comfortable saying to a doctor, F off, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I was just kind of like, how is this relevant to the problem that we're talking about now? Mm -hmm. And she was like, well, it could be relevant. And I was like, no. And she was just, she was just prescribing exercise to me and without asking mm -hmm. what exercise I currently engaged in. And I was just like, 
this is tired. This is mm-hmm. old and tired and I'm not here for it. Talk to me about my results and then I'm leaving. Yeah. And when I come back next week for follow up, I'm not going to be seeing you, you know, like mm-hmm. this is bullshit, but I am very privileged. Mm-hmm. I can do that. I was raised in a home with, you know, a family that gave me that capability. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it's reminding me of, we talked about Instagram earlier, and I'm going to have to send you this link. There's a higher weight Instagrammer who rewrote some of Lizzo's lyrics on Truth Hurts. And it's like, I just got a BMI test. I found out I'm a hundred percent. And it's real. It's all, it's all <laughs> to like reject the medical model weight stigma BS. And it's so good. And and I said on her post, I was like, you have to record this. She's like, I already did. But, you know, kind of like very poorly, obviously. But it is it is a hoot. And I'm like, I love stuff like this. This is what I want to did share. Did she tag Lizzo? Lizzo would fucking love it. I hope she did. And I hope Lizzo sees it and shares it. That would be amazing. But yeah, look, I have had such a great conversation with you today. I, know, I feel like we, we talked totally forever. The gamut today. <laughs> it was awesome. And I'm so glad at the beginning we got to talk about Bless This Mess. I because I definitely want um, yeah. listeners to tune in and find and follow you. Your podcast is called Go Help Yourself. I know that's gonna become one of my listeners' favorites soon. Um, but we didn't talk yet about your Instagram live show. So what what can you tell us about that so we can yes. check that out too? Thank you. So every Sunday at 1230 Pacific, so that's 330 Eastern, mm-hmm. I go live on Instagram um, at It's Linky, I-T-S-L-I-N-K-E. Mm-hmm. And I do a live improv comedy show. Since I started out in improv, I don't really get to do it so much out here. Mm-hmm. So um, I wanted to find a way to just kind of keep things fresh for myself. And I log on at 1230 and I go live and whoever shows up, they throw me suggestions and I do 60 second character monologues and scenes sometimes. And sometimes I have special guests because in that Instagram live feature, you can invite people in. Um, sometimes I'm with people and we do scenes and then it stays live for 24 hours afterwards. And it's just like a nice fun way. I've created so many fun characters out of that. Yeah. And wherever you are, it's, it's the best kind of improv show. You don't have to pay any money. You don't have to leave the house. You don't have to look for parking or pay a drink minimum yeah. or and if it's bad, you leave. Like there's, <laughs> you don't have to pay the entire time. You could come late, leave early. You can do whatever you want. And I don't care. So, you know, you don't have to wait until awkwardly until afterwards to tell your friends like, it was so good. Like you don't have to do that. You can come in. If it's not your jam that day, you leave. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. And, you know, I love that even from a body kindness practice. Uh, you know, I talk about how laughter really is the best medicine. It, it You feel laughter and humor show up in your body in positive ways. And so, yeah, we'll just log yeah. on, check you out and and hopefully we get yeah. to meet a really cool and interesting character and like laugh at you for a little bit. Yeah. Laugh so, like, at your craft, of course. Um, <laughs> no, laugh at me, please. <laughs> yesterday, uh, they gave me a suggestion of environmentalists. And so I just was this woman, this individual woman freaking out about all the things that she wasn't doing to help save the planet and how the planet was still going down. You know, she was like, I haven't used a straw in seven months and all my clothes are ruined because I'm very messy and I can't dry clean things, you know, and like she just was going on the spiral. It was really, it was really fun. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. And as they say, if you don't laugh, you, you'll, you'll cry. Right. So a good dose of humor is helpful for everyone. I think. I say let's do both. Yes, there we go. <laughs> and what we say in the beginning, lift each other up and uh, validate each other in a bar for 24 hours. Oh, yeah. Spend the whole night validating the <laughs> shit out of each other. There we go. Awesome. Where can <laughs> folks find you to stay in touch with you and get all your social media handles and all those things? Yeah, so all of my social media is It's Linky, I-T-S-L-I-N-K-E. Um, and then I'm on Facebook at Lisa Linky. And that's kind of it. I mean... I'm accessible, baby. <laughs> that is awesome. Okay. Well, I can't wait to do your podcast. I'm going to, I'm going to yeah, um, so have fun. a great chat. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking. We with love me having authors today. on. So we'll read your book and then we'll have you on to interview you about it. All right. That sounds so good. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Yay. Thank you. And that's our show. The podcast is made possible with support from listeners please donate to help offset production costs at gofundme.com slash body kindness. And please rate and review the show when you have a moment. It really matters. Let's keep the conversations going on Facebook. Search body kindness and request to join the group for body kindness readers and listeners. Have a question for us to answer on a future episode? 
visit bodykindnessbook.com slash question. Body Kindness books and audiobooks are available wherever books are sold. To request a signed print copy, visit bodykindnessbook.com slash order. For other questions about this podcast, please email info at bodykindnessbook.com. Thank you.